All right, welcome back, Ian. Ian Dunbar. Hi, Felix. Good afternoon. Did you enjoy your lunch? Yes. What have you had? I didn't have any lunch. I was too busy. Ah, oh, shame on you. Um, yeah, I had two sandwiches, and yeah, we're you, back. Had, you had a Dutch lunch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably. A sandwich and a glass of milk. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we're back at the pit, and we're seeing a team from Slovenia today. That's right. The team have come from Slovenia. Um, first time I've met this team. I, I have assessed in the past, but I've never met this team before. Um, and they have quite a, uh, a complex little challenge. The car's on its side, and the, we know the patient is in the uh, in the red car, quite low down. Um, they've decided they've not tried to move the uh, the small opal. And what they're trying to do now is, I think they're trying to make rapid access to get into the patient. They've identified there's a patient. They can probably see him through the front windscreen, and they're trying to get in. First time today we see one of the V-struts being used. That's right, it's the first time we've had a car on its side, so uh, the guys have very well and uh, ably deployed the V-strut. And what we do with the teams, uh, some of the teams who compete may not have used our equipment before, so before they actually come into the pits, they, after they've registered, they go around the back with one of my colleagues, Jan van Akoy, and they, um, they have equipment familiarization, so by, by the time they get to the pits, they're really au fait and, and, and happy with the way our equipment works and how to operate it safely. Where's the victim situated in the car? The victim, yeah. What we've simulated here is a vehicle rollover with a vehicle landing on its side. And we've simulated the, the driver was not wearing a seatbelt. Okay. So with the car coming to rest in this position, he's low down. He's basically lying on the right-hand side of the vehicle. On the, on on the, the floor. Oh, Which is now the floor, yeah. yeah it effectively okay. becomes the floor. So it's a very awkward position. Um, I can virtually guarantee his airway will be compromised <laughs> uh, because we told him to, to lie in that position. So Is it easier for, for the team when the victim is in the seatbelt or when it's free like if, in the if, vehicle? The, if the patient is actually in the seatbelt um, it's a positive because the the mechanism of injury will likely be less because the, the seatbelt will, will prevent a lot of a lot of injury stabilized yeah um, however if the car comes to rest on its side or on its roof and the casualty is suspended by the seatbelt that can cause further trauma sure because you're suspended and it can cause a, a, a few things i won't go into from a medical point of view but that has to be considered as well so if the patient is suspended in the seatbelt the team have to figure that in as well and before they actually finally extricate him they have to release him from the seatbelt and, and make him essentially more comfortable is it possible for us to move to the side so we see something yeah let's, let's go down here yes all right, ladies and gentlemen, we're moving inside the pit right now, so we get a closer view of what's actually happening at the moment. Following you. That's a better view. So you can see on this side of the vehicle, we've, we've made it a little bit more difficult as well by putting the, our fake tree in the way. All right. Um, and what our simulator is, they don't have full access to the roof. With the vehicle on its side, you can create a lot of space by cutting the pillars and then putting relief cuts in the, top, in the bottom of the roof and effectively folding it down. Okay. Okay. Because we have our big black tree in the way, they can't Doesn't do that, work. so they have to come up with another option. Glass dust. <laughs> so yeah, we've uh, those of you listening on live stream and watching, we've just caught in a little bit of glass dust there. You'll notice everyone in the pits wearing respiratory protection, but myself and Felix are not, because it tends to uh, affect our conversation. I think, Felix. <laughs> uh, so we just moved out of the way. It's a bit, bit of a breeze blowing, and um, if you're watching on live stream, you would have seen the glass dust there blowing in the wind. So we just adjusted our position slightly. <laughs> so now what the guys have done is they removed the glass from the windscreen and that's given them patient access. Their access has been delayed because it's, it's difficult to get in the vehicle. However, the grey opal, we've actually set the scenario 
so the Opal is actually movable. So if they'd have got inside the car, released the handbrake, they could have reversed it back, opened up the back of the car, and they could have had some good access yeah. and egress. Because they've elected uh, to leave the grey Opal where it is in position, I think it's going to become more and more complex for them now because they have very, very limited options. So what the guys are doing now is they are systematically removing the glass. Um, well, kind of systematically. <laughs> so you can see just by the position of the vehicles and, and blocking access, you really make it difficult for crews to, to gain access and really perform their job e efficiently and safely. So everything now is compromised. Everything is in through the windscreen and it's looking like it's going to be out through the windscreen as well. And all because they didn't uh, try and move the car, the, uh, the silver grey Opal, so. So removing the Opal, going through the back. Removing the Opal, I think, will be one of the major Best learning options. points. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But it's 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 one of those things. It's, it's part of the, it's the part competition of the, it's, that you yeah. will tell, let them know after yeah, afterwards. Precisely. Yeah. So it's uh, yeah, it's all part of the learning process, you know. All right. So you probably can't see on live stream, but we have a, a fittest firefighter going on. Toughest fire Tough, firefighter. Oh, toughest firefighter. <laughs> uh, it's making me tired just looking at it. So uh, <laughs> back to the extrication. Yeah, the guys, the guys are making a bit of progress now. They've started to uh, cut the A pillars on the vehicle. I'm really not sure what their plan is at this moment. Um, of course, we're on the opposite side of the vehicle. It's a little bit difficult to tell, but it's severely restricted access for these guys. So it uh, it may prove difficult. Yeah, so you can see one of the guys uh, for the first time today, I think, using one of our hydraulic yes, rams. Yeah, I think it is. Today. Oh, that's a great camera shot you can actually see inside the vehicle. And you can see how much of a confined space it is for the medic working in there. It's so, really tight. Yeah, so you can see the sheet being placed over not only the casualty, but the medic as well, because the, the, the medic, so the firefighter in there, needs protecting from the glass and, and anything that could potentially fly from the result of cutting. So. So the other, the other thing I've noticed is it's, uh, it's now a lot more than it was a couple of hours ago. 
So if, uh, if this extrication is difficult for these guys, it's become even more difficult because of the weather. That's closer than we were before. Yeah, we, uh, the wonder of technology, we've now come inside the, uh, the truck and we can see everything uh, on the big screen that saves us moving around. So you can see, we talk about how lightweight uh, tills have become in the last few years. And when you have to work with a till at, at, you know, at that height, that's where it becomes really, really important. So you're working above waist height, the lighter the tills are, the easier uh, they are to use. So one of the guys from the other team uh, before just said um, that the, the weight of the tool doesn't, it's not interesting anymore in case of an emergency when the adrenaline is high. Well, the, the thing is, it's not that it's not important, it's that the guys probably don't think about the weight of the tool. They forget what about what it. they want is they want to pick the tool up and they want it to work. Um, having said that, if the tool is you know three or four kilos heavier than the tools they're using now, they will become tired more quickly. And while they may not notice immediately the weight of the tool, what they will notice is how how, how much more quickly they become tired, especially if they're working in the kind of angles that they're working at the moment, you know, above waist height. So the, t the, the weight of the tool is important, but it's more a subconscious thing, certainly in the heat of battle when the red mist has come down. So, And, you know, weight is, is not just about weight in the firefighter's hands, a, a, a whole rescue set. Um, the more weight you can save with the rescue set means the truck is carried on is now reduced in weight, and that fire service can carry more, more, sure. more equipment. So, you know, weight is not just for the individual, it's, it's about the, the vehicle that carries the equipment as well. They can be really happy that the tree is not as high as a real tree would be. They yeah, we, reach we, over did, it. we did think about bringing in uh, a big tree, um, <laughs> but we, we, we figured that fabricating a steel one was a lot easier and uh, a lot cheaper, so. <laughs> But you can see it's serving the purpose. Um, and unfort it uh, you know, unfortunately, um, in my career, I went to a lot of incidents where, where cars come into contact with trees, and, and as they say, trees just simply will not move. They will yeah. not yield. So you're very often left with a car that is, to, you know, uh, is basically wrapped around a tree because the, the tree will not yield at all, and the, the construction of the vehicle yields well before the tree will. Casualty, Dara. He's uh, he's going to be quite warm as well. Yes. I think because he's he's in the vehicle. He's got a big guy from Slovenia over him, talking to him, <laughs> in, you know, right in his face. They're both covered over with a plastic sheet, so they're in a little sauna in there. Sauna, so it's going yeah. to be really uncomfortable, you know. But again, for a real patient and a real medic, um, and if we move away from Germany, if we go to the Middle East or other places in the world where it's consistently 35, 40 degrees, you know, temperature and humidity does play a part on rescue. It affects the way you dress, the kind of helmet of you wear and yeah. things like that. So, um, you know, the environmental factors have a you know, big part to play in rescue and how you consider your training and things like that. So it's something we take for granted, I think, in, in Germany and the Netherlands. We have, we have some nice weather, but it's never extreme weather. So you can see the command assessor, the guy in the white helmets, because there's a lot of guys working in a very small space. Like we said earlier, safety is key. So what Alan is doing, he's moving a little bit closer and he's just checking the tool use. It's not that he thinks the guys are gonna hurt themselves or someone else, it's just that it's, it's, such, a, it's such a focused area of work at the moment, he just has to, you know, he has to cast a critical eye. It's actually quite impressive when you consider the, um, they had a real, it was a real restricted space they had and they have, you know, they've blown that roof with a ram and spreaders and they have created a little bit of room there. The problem is, is that they can't easily get either side of their patient in order to get hands and physically move him from yeah. the car. So that's where it's going to become really, really difficult. Also, I think the assessors will pick up the fact if you look at the way the guys are working, 
and also the, the, the glass has not really been adequately protected, the sharp edges. But that's one reason why the, the, the assessors are really, really close. And there's Dara. He's looking... Uh, now he's awake. He's talking. <laughs> It's, it's so much more difficult after a hard lunch, isn't it, Dara? Look at him. He's having an <laughs> afternoon nap there, the boy. Uh, this time next year, we'll have to call him Dr. Matthews. He's, um, he's on the verge of qualifying as a doctor. So, he's a very clever chap. And when you have a very, very small entry, you, you, you quickly find it's just yeah, full of heads and bottoms, that's all you can see because everyone puts their head in the car. And another tip here for the guys, and I think the assessors will mention it, is they've now finished with the hydraulic equipment, but they've left their pump running. So it's it's not a problem. That's what I've actually noticed yeah, outside. Yeah, it's, it's, like it's not a problem. It's just that it's just compromising communication. Just just that little bit. I mean, the pump is not loud, but if they turn it off, they'll just have that little bit more easy yeah, communication. Absolutely. But what they've done is is pretty phenomenal considering the restricted space they had to work in. And you can see there, there's a there's a clear exit path for for Dara, but I think it is going to be difficult to to get him out in a in a casualty centered way. see the assessor watching intently and uh, he's watching every move the guys make principally for safety but also he's, he's, he's picking up any, any good points and any learning points that he can feed back in the debrief and we've only got five more minutes so it's almost over time to get him out that's Kimmy He's uh, one of my colleagues from Homacho in China. He's uh, shadow assessing today, so he's learning how to become an assessor. He's watching Alan very closely. And the idea of Kim is by the end of the week, he'll look at his marks and he'll look at the, the, the marks Alan has given. And if Kimmy is within 10% of, of the marks, we know he's assessing to a very similar standard to Alan. So Kimmy's very excited by the opportunity to, uh, to work with someone so experienced. There's the cameraman trying to uh, zoom in on the scores there, which is a little bit naughty. <laughs> I'll be having a word with him uh, at the end of this one. For the first time today, we've had a patient out of the vehicle. Pretty good. So is this the end of the extrication? or No, they still have 20 minutes. What the team can do is, if they're convinced they can do absolutely no more, they can. the instant commander can raise his head and say, that's it, we're finished. Okay. But generally what happens at this point is the, the guys, um, as part of the, the medical side, if you like, the medical assessment, what they will do is package him ready for onward transportation. So what we're starting to move into now is, is an ambulance about to arrive and the fire medics will package the guy on a board with straps and they will uh, prepare him for handover to an ambulance. What's interesting as well is that um, the team, if the team do this brilliantly well, yeah, they will score good points. If they start to do things not very well here they can actually lose points so they can become a victim of their own success getting the patient <laughs> out you know with, with with five minutes to go i think the whistle has just gone so all right thank you ian i'm going to go outside and ask 